Welcome all. Um, welcome to our audience. Welcome to our panelists. And special welcome to our presenter today, Julie Kleinman, who will be talking about her book, Adventure Capital, Migration and the Making of an African Hub in Paris. Julie comes to us from Fordham University. And so she'll speak briefly about the book and then we'll have commentary from Lori Hain Hart, uh, Kane Hart, I'm sorry, Lori Hart, but you, I was reading your name and the cane threw me um, from our own anthro department here at UCLA. Um, after that, we'll open it up to the audience for questions, comments at any time. You can write questions in the chat or, um, uh, when we get to the conversation, you can use the raise hand function, et cetera. Um, so without further ado, we're excited to hear about your new book, Julie, take it away. Thank you so much um, for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, I'm excited to talk to you today, even by Zoom about my book. I think we're all used to these now. Um, so let me share um, my, my images with you. Um, I believe you can see them now. Um, yeah, so I'm here to talk to you today uh, about my book and sort of the process of my book and what, what I'm trying to do with it. Um, and I really appreciate the, this invitation, especially because um, Lori was one of my undergraduate mentors. Um, and so uh, it's especially meaningful for, for that reason. Um, so uh, yeah, my book is called Adventure Capital. Migration and the Making of an African Hub in Paris. Um, and in this book, I try to do something, I think a little different in terms of the study of migration in France, which many of you may or may not be familiar with. Um, sounds like at least a few of you are. So um, if you are familiar with it, you're probably used to hearing the terms like peripheries, enclave, segregation, communitarianism. Um, these are the words you notice again and again when discussing populations of so-called immigrant origin in France. But in my book, I'm looking instead at what things like migration, race, and public space and its boundaries look like if instead you begin not with the perspective of the periphery and exclusion, but of a central hub of connection and exchange, in this case, the Gare du Nord railway station. Um, in Paris. So I want to take a few minutes to introduce you to the station and how I ended up studying it. Um, so I'm just curious, like, how many of you have been to the Gare du Nord? Um, does it have any of you? Okay, so at least, um, a, at least uh, about half, at least. Um, so you've been to it, so you can perhaps relate your experience of the station um, to the different kinds of ways that it gets represented and thought about. Um, so like many railway stations across the world, uh, the Gare du Nord has long been a magnet for those who exist on society's margins, often excluded from full participation in urban citizenship. These populations congregate in and around the station alongside the throngs of passengers taking international trains and commuting um, to and from work through or to and from the capital. The station has often been used as an example of France's urban ills, a dangerous and seedy locale where African immigrants, this is how it's represented, where African immigrants and their descendants were accused of taking over Parisian public space by several politicians who use this kind of language. Um, a former interior minister called the station, quote, symbolic of violence in public transport. According to the head of John Lewis, which is one of the biggest English department store chains, um, the station is the squalor pit of Europe, also known as. Um, it also contains a literal border. So because of the Eurostar going to London that goes through the station, um, there's an EU EK border within the station that you have to pass through if you're taking that train. Um, now in the popular imaginary of many of the um, sort of commuters from the Paris region whom I spoke to, they saw the station as a kind of an unavoidable nuisance that they had to pass through to get where they're going. Um, however, all of this, uh, of course, uh, does not really capture what the station fully means uh, to the, especially to the communities um, who have defined the area directly around the station. So people who live close to the station. Uh, so for example, and I just wanna give a couple examples of these, the way that it's sort of represented in, in some literature. Um, the Algerian French novelist, Abdelkader Jemai, um, 
And for the Chibanis of the Algerian retirees who populate his novella the Gard called Gare du Nord, the station is a symbol of warmth and connection holding the promise of distant lands. So he writes, as soon as they approached the Gare du Nord, um, this is the Chibanis, they felt attracted by its warm atmosphere, its feminine forms, and by the soft light that had the color of a good beer. It was the port where they debarked depending on their mood and their imagination. So although the station reminds them of their precariousness, their quote, fear of ending up homeless, like all of those on the sidewalks of the Gare du Nord, end quote, it remains a mobile home away from home, befitting to lives woven in the interstices of urban life in France. Or as the writer Suketu Mehta speculates, maybe what keeps the immigrants in the area is the knowledge that the first door to home is just there in the station, two blocks away. The energy of travelers is comforting for it makes us feel that the whole world like us is transient. Now these narratives and others like it anchor the station to the immigrant history of Northeast Paris where it is located. Over the last two decades or so, the Gare du Nord has become known as a meeting place, especially for many immigrant groups, but especially for West and Central Africans struggling to get by in France and looking for work, cash, papers, potential patrons to help them, and even for romance. Young men meet at the station, give each other, um, Um, advice on where to find employment. Um, they loan money to one another. They exchange information about everything from the latest fashions to the best ways to, to meet French women. The many migrants I met at the station often use the word crossroads to describe it. Um, and for them, it was unlike the segregated spaces of the Paris capital region, so often studied in scholarship on migration, the Gau brings, to, brings together people from different backgrounds. So, um, you know, one of, one of the, the Malians um, who I spoke to a lot and who I'll talk about later in the paper, uh, he used to say, we all started out in the immigrant dormitory. And here he's referring to these foyers uh, built in the 1960s in France to house foreign workers. But we didn't stay there very long, he continues. We didn't want to put ourselves on the sidelines. His friend Mahmoud, an older Pakistani man who had been in France for decades, agreed with him. You don't want to be on the sidelines, so you come to the Gare du Nord, he said. Many migrants saw the station as a site of convergence and of social potential. Lassana and his peers also said that it helped them to understand and live in what he called the real France, the one hidden by media representations and invisible from the sidelines, as he put it, of suburban housing projects and immigrant dormitories. So how did I end up writing a book about all of this? Uh, well, my attention turned to the Gare du Nord around the same time as a lot of the French public um, in 2007, which was in the middle of the um, presidential election campaigns. Um, during this time in March of 2007, the station erupted in what newspapers would refer to as a riot. Um, essentially what happened was that the violent uh, arrest of a Congolese man in the station uh, ended up provoking confrontations between many of the people who began to use the station around rush hour um, and the police um, and who, you know, who sort of came to the, the defense of um, the, the man who was violently arrested. Um, now these conflicts ended up leading to some property damage um, you know, and following the event, however, it became this huge thing which was called a riot um, and was, you know, it was referred to as vandalism. And you can sort of see one of the main um, sort of Parisian dailies here, uh, uh, Le Parisien, uh, how they represented um, the way the way that um, this event unfolded and who the main actors were. Uh, so the three main presidential candidates gave speeches about the event following um, following it and they represented the actors in this event as being black and immigrant origin. So an electoral brawl really broke out at this point about what kind of order the French state should have and who could legitimately occupy its public spaces. I think this was a key moment in the elections and it helped candidate Nicolas Sarkozy bring the, deba the debate back to his cornerstone issues of insecurity, um, immigration and national identity. Um, so this event really led me to look more closely at the space 
launching what would end up being a more than a 10 year project um, on the Gare du Nord. I wanted to know how a train station ended up being at the center of French public debate at such a crucial moment. What I found was that by examining the station from the perspective of the state, but also of urban planners, um, of various migrant groups who in some ways really remake this public space, um, that the Gare du Nord, I think, could be good to think with, um, helping us to think differently about urban space, race, and migration in France today. So, you know, if you think about the scholarly context for the study, I think several of you are perhaps familiar with it. Um, but if you look over the last few decades, um, obviously many studies have addressed questions of immigration and also public space rising segregation, uh, urban space in France. We know that French public policies such as public housing development um, have led to the creation uh, of, you know, overall sort of exclude areas that are sort of excluded, seen as, as spaces of exclusion, um, spaces of segregation, um, and sort of overall social and economic exclusion. But it's almost impossible to evoke the migrant question in France today without immediately conjuring up this kind of image. And this is taken from the New York Times. Um, it's, you know, the housing block tower in a gray banlieue. And this is especially, I think, in, in the US press, that's what you see. So um, the realities of these environs and of course the challenges faced by the segregation and exclusion very much merit attention. I found that the focus on exclusion and segregation risks performing a kind of scholarly ghettoization that equates immigrants with these outer cities or suburbs uh, in the French speak. It also tends to belie the connections that persist between the periphery and the center, sort of making this some sort of hard line that can't be crossed. Um, and I don't think you can escape those connections when you're looking at a place like the Gare du Nord. So I set off to look at the station and what guided me was to imagine this, uh, well, there were two things. The first thing was to imagine the space um, as seeing it as the view from the tracks. So what did the questions that I wanted to examine, um, questions of the polit French politics of difference, um, migrant migration, migrant experience, um, the formation of urban space and how migration was related to that. What did all that look like if you took the view from the tracks? And this is actually a painting called the view from the tracks of the Gare du Nord. Um, and, and that was sort of the, one of the guiding things that I tried to look at um, and to understand how urban space was produced, not just through um, sort of official policies and, you know, official you know, political spaces, but also um, through on the ground encounters in a hub like this. Um, now I'm, I'm an anthropologist. And so most of what I ended up doing was participant observation. Um, and to get at this perspective from the tracks, I tried to, you know, interview um, people at the station, but I didn't find that that was very helpful. So what I really ended up doing was just doing observing what people did and then accompanying people on their itineraries through the station um, and around it, but also, um, you know, following the, the tracks outside of the station. Um, I also spent two months working as a, a national railway SNCF uh, intern at the station, um, a customer service intern, and then I also followed its tracks out, whether they took me to immigrant dormitories, um, to Parisian metro planning and train architecture firms, uh, through the channel to London, and even on a more of a metaphorical note, um, to, to Bamako and to migrant home villages in the Kai region of Mali, where I accompanied people I met at the station. Um, so, and this is really the other side of my project, or I think these two sides come together, which is the angle of people using the Gare du Nord um, as a kind of strategy to deal with increasingly precarious lives and livelihoods um, in France. Um, and particularly, I ended up studying West African migrants. I focused especially on a group of, I would say a loosely group of, uh, of about 30 um, people, mostly from the Western Sahel region, um, spreading across Senegal, Mauritania, Mali, and Guinea. Uh, one member of that group is the person I call Lassana, pictured here on the left, um, is the moral center of my book. He grew up in the Senegal River Valley of Western Mali, and this map, um, sort of shows his multi-year voyage from his home through West Africa um, that he embarked on before coming to France. We are adventurers here, he used to say. That is, you know, not foreigners or guest workers or even migrants, certainly not refugees. 
Um, many West Africans I met in France use the term l'aventure, adventure, and l'aventurier, adventurer, to describe themselves in their situation, and not merely in an attempt to sort of romanticize um, difficult experiences. Rather, these terms and their equivalents have long been used among West African migrants around the world and signify the idea that migration is an initiatory journey, a rite of passage. Seeing their voyage as part of a broader tradition helped to maintain family relationships across long distances and gave migrants a way, I found, to find meaning in risky travels and travails abroad. So Ninke people are the greatest adventurers, Lassana once claimed, referring to his ethno-linguistic groups that comprised about 2 million people concentrated in several countries in the Sahel, in this area of West Africa, as well as in diaspora communities across the globe. His father, grandfather, and uncles had all left on adventures of their own um, in their, in, during their youth. And most of his brothers, brothers and cousins were on their own adventures in Central Africa and Spain. Now, I found this vision compelling in part because it was so different from many of the assumptions of so-called economic migration applied to migrants like Lassana, which assumes that migration is a relatively new phenomenon uh, in, the, in this particular case, of course, um, where poor people are forced to leave underdeveloped villages in Africa and go to work in European capitals. Lassana rather saw migration as a necessary stage of life and the continuation of a long tradition. And of course, he's not alone. You know, there's lots of work that shows how many West African and Central African migrants um, come from places where it has been said, not migrating is not living. The idiom of adventure is a way for Lasna and other West Africans to conceptualize their own journeys. But I think it also provides a lens for understanding migrant lives and struggles more broadly, kind of um, theorization of migrant and, now, and an analysis of what migration might mean. At this railway hub, Lassen and his peers saw themselves as continuing the tradition um, of, this, of the adventure by practicing what they called the Gare du Nord method, which they defined as a kind of an attempt to make social and economic networks outside of their national or ethnic communities. Oh, sorry. <laughs> These are the French terms. I, I forgot to include that. Um, so, whoops. So, Okay, so what I found through all of this research, um, I think resonates perhaps with some of your own research or certainly resonates with the ways that migrants across the world are inventing new strategies to confront increasingly difficult circumstances. Um, much recent scholarship has explored how migrant communities create social networks and community among co-nationals or co-ethnics. Such strategies then end up playing into what the French state deplores as what they call communitarianism, by which they mean the way that migrants create enclaves that purportedly bar their integration into French ways of life. In my book, I suggest that the opposite is true. Instead of extending their networks of co-ethnics in France, West African migrants at the Gare du Nord depart from their kin village and communities to create social ties and even families across national, ethnic, and class boundaries. Meanwhile, it is rather the French state that promotes this communitarianism through racial profiling and policies such as urban development and new legal regulations, such as those aimed at curbing marriages between French citizens and non-nationals. In my book, I go from the construction of a 19th century railway station in Paris to the construction of a house being built on the outskirts of the Malian capital of Bamako through connections made at that station. I explore how the Gare du Nord gets constructed and redesigned, and then how West Africans use and transform it. I argue that their adventure imaginaries and practices offer a critique of the French politics of difference and the marginalization it produces, as well as an alternative model for how we might imagine uh, what migration management migrant inter integration, and this elusive goal of what is uh, called, you know, living together, le vivre ensemble, might actually be. As the station was built in the 1860s, um, planners thought to counter the menace of provincial French migrants who had come um, via the railways to, quote, pollute Parisian blood, as one commentator put it at the time. And I explored this to show, 
you know, how the station from its very construction was carefully partitioned to minimize social mixing and cordon off the station from the disruptive potential of the surrounding urban environment as its managers saw it at the time. From its beginnings in, the, in 1864, the Gare du Nord had a particular status of being a true contact zone where people from various walks of life might encounter one another, from urban outcasts and vagabonds to foreign dignitaries. Since it was also an emblem of French progress that embodied the hopes and fears of urban modernity, I think this is why it provides such a compelling lens to examine how the state and railways together created and enforced social boundaries and how these boundaries shifted over time. In my book, I argue that this history illustrates that racial and cultural hierarchies and the sometimes violent projects of assimilation and integration are not recent issues or somehow problems that immigrants have brought or imported into France, but rather they have been a constitutive part of the development of French society and urban spaces and of the Gare du Nord itself. Now, as these boundaries shifted and throughout the 20th century, the station in theory became more inclusive. The 19th century physical separation has dissolved and the station has become more connected to the surrounding area. At the same time, policing and surveillance have exponentially increased as I'm sure won't be much of a surprise. The Gare du Nord got a major facelift starting in the late 1990s. It was a product of a kind of paradigm shift as transportation planners and architects were rethinking how and for whom they designed infrastructure. The design for the new Gare du Nord came from two places. First of all, there was their architectural firm who designed it, and then there was the Paris Metro Planning Office. Um, you know, and I just want to show you a few of the images of how these offices see and represent the Gare du Nord. Um, so this is from um, the, the, the Metro Planning Office, um, and they created this idea of um, uh, of exchange, and they were they were very interested in creating uh, sites of transportation as sites of not just uh, physical or you know the, the sort of transfer from one type of transportation to another, but actually of social exchange. However, when I talked to the head of this office, um, you know, uh, they tended to see that I, as an anthropologist, would not really be of interest to them because. I was looking at what they called marginal uses um, of the station, and they wanted to look at what they call average users. Um, and he you know, cited particularly immigrants and Africans as examples of quote unquote marginal uses, and thus um, not sort of the average user that he was interested in targeting with his design. And this is a very conceptual planning office. So what I found intriguing is that the users that he dismisses as these kind of marginal, marginal men are precisely those who try to make a meaningful social environment out of the station. Um, it's just that they don't do it in the way that the planners imagined. Uh, and one of the architects behind the renovation project said that the station, like a transparent democratic public sphere, should really be a spatial, a, spa a place of exchange where and social mixing, um, where individuals are not segregated by their modes of transport, you know, personally using this kind of um, public sphere, almost Habermasian language. Um, the new station became an allegory for the French Republican ideals of le vivre ensemble or living together, in which the physical integration of the built environment stands in for the assimilation of various groups into the French body politic. At the same time, planners chose to ignore the eruptions of difference, such as those based on race and ethnicity, as they manifest in public spaces, everyday interactions, and police practices. So um, now let me focus, you know, on from the to, on the perspective of migrants, which was really a, a major focus of my book. Um, you know, who so I think have to confront this space, but also remake it. Uh, and they remake it in part through their Gare du Nord method, uh, that, that sort of set of strategies for overcoming risk and finding success on their voyages abroad, um, using what they often refer to as this international station to make networks um, outside of their kin and village communities in France. Um, and they sought instead to highlight the value of encounters across difference. Um, and in, in some way highlight boundaries like race um, ethnicity, national nationality, um, as things that could be productive for them, productive of social and even economic value. 
Um, so the, the Gaudinor method is really something I think that they would see as combining the lessons of what they saw as courage and discipline that they learned in their upbringing um, with the strategies that they learned on the road across West and Central Africa, because most of them spent years on the road um, in West and Central Africa before coming to France, um, as well as the knowledge they gain through their experience in France. Uh, and this is kind of a, a tinkering, I think, bricoleur-like practice um, where they notice the gaps within the infrastructure of the station and try to fill them in, creating an alternative system of relations than the one for which the infrastructure was initially designed. Um, so from a kind of hub of metropolitan transport, you know, it's the largest railway station in Europe, um, and the third largest in the world, the Yadunor method makes the station into a hub for West African networks of value creation. Um, and I track in my book how this happens through these informal money transfer systems that they create there, uh, through micro savings networks that they create across um, ethnic and family lines, which is unusual, uh, as well as providing services where these are, there are these infrastructural gaps, um, or just by creating relations, uh, whether friendship, or um, romantic relations with people you know, outside of their um, national communities. So to put this method into practice, um, what they need to do is master the um, formal infrastructure and then re-channel it. And I describe this in my book as a kind of infrastructural hacking. So of course, this is about not staying on the sidelines of urban life by reimagining, um, by remaining, sorry, not staying in the sidelines of urban life by by remaining in the suburbs and immigrant dormitories, but leaving those places um, to undergo what is often described as almost a kind of apprenticeship where adventurers learn certain skills um, operating in tandem to the work that they do, the sort of paid work that they do um, in the uh, temporary work sector, what's called intérimaire in France. Um, and especially many of them were in the field of construction and also in the uh, so the station itself becomes a kind of informal, um, horizontally organized temporary work agency, um, which was better for them because it was less humiliating than what they experienced at actual temp work agencies, um, and often more favorable to them than the jobs that they could get through their kin connections and family members in France. Uh, so one of the things they also did was try to spot gaps in information and linkages between the city and the railway station using the kind of know-how and social relationships to reappropriate infrastructures. So one example of this um, is they would, they noticed that there was no one to carry bags, um, all the big suitcases that many travelers would come in. Um, there were no, none of those push carts um, at the station. And so, um, they, you know, a few of them noticed this. So they, they took some of those push carts from, they managed to get some, reappropriate some from the airport um, and then, um, you know, use them themselves to become a kind of unofficial, but more or less accepted um, porter, uh, you know, who would uh, take people's luggage to and from the station. Um, now, I think through all of these different practices, these different networks that they're creating, um, and this infrastructural hacking, um, you know, I argue that this is really a, an alternative form of integration. And I use that word on purpose just because it's, you know, often the key word used when discussing immigration in France. And the reason I argue that is because, you know, the official integration model implies that Africans must leave their own community and values and adopt Frenchness, even though they will never be continue, considered fully French. So, this includes acquiring knowledge about French traditions, learning interactional norms um, of how to behave in public, for example, um, gaining the ability to communicate in French are often seen as part of the integration process in which foreigners become citizens. Um, West Africans at the station who really weren't that interested in becoming French citizens, but um, they emphasize the importance of gaining French linguistic and social knowledge. They don't see it as a linear path toward assimilation, but rather part of how they thought, sought to expand and multiply networks and social relations. So despite their efforts and deep knowledge of the region's transportation infrastructure, and they really knew the, the, the railway and the, all of the transportation infrastructure in and out, um, because of the labor market, the policing practices, which are also focused in my book, as well as um, how they are treated in the French public sphere, Africans are accused of backwardness as overrunning the social order and of refusing to integrate. 
um, and adopt French customs, um, you know, often their their attempts here were were somewhat limited um, in terms of you know how successful they would be, even if they were very good at the Galdinor method. Um, so all of the men I met struggled throughout their time in France, going through periods of unemployment accompanied by legal and economic insecurity. The Galdinor method did not often work to find really sustainable livelihoods. Um, Indeed, how could any strategy really lead to success in such a context? But it did try to recover some of the lost dignity and to carve out an alternative pathway toward real integration, making a small corner of life where these men could patch together a meaningful existence. Okay, so where does that, um, this story of sort of intersecting views um, where uh, sort of history of a railway station in Paris meet um, the lives of West African adventurers? Where does this leave us? Um, I think still in many ways today, the Gare du Nord remains a place of ill repute, of danger and of annoyance for these so-called average users. By seeing the Gare du Nord from adventurer eyes, however, we see something else. It's social potential for helping adventurers eke out a meaningful life in Paris, to practice their own form of social um, and infrastructural integration into an urban space. And through these efforts, the Gaudinor has become an actual exchange hub to use the, the transportation planner's lingo. Integration here leaves the abstract realm of laws and political speeches and becomes enacted on a public space. But unsurprisingly, this form of inter integration has been singled out as an illegitimate use um, of French public space, often by the police, by other train users, and by political commentators who convey the message they don't belong here. Um, and just a last note to bookend all of this and bring this final point home. The Gare du Nord is once again being redesigned and expanded, or at least that was the plan, although now it's sort of become this huge controversy. Um, a group of French architects, uh, including Jean Nouvel, have recently come out virulently against the new plan, calling it indecent and absurd, a plan that would turn the station into a large mall that would look more like an airport and make it more difficult for passengers to access trains directly and creating a gift for, you know, creating indeed a gift for commercial interests in a public-private partnership redesign with the French retail giant Auchan. But I've rather noticed something else about these plans, which I've put here, and the architectural simulations presented for this new design, which would include a jogging track and a co-working space. Um, as we see here, apparently all the new users of this future Gal du Nord would be basically well-heeled white Parisians enjoying some shopping and leisure time, or maybe some productivity before they head to their train. But this is far from the reality that has made the Gare du Nord what it is. And my prediction is that whatever redesign ends up occurring, there will remain new spaces to master and new infrastructural hacks to be made. The real exchange hub, the place making transport into a form of social exchange is not to be found in these kinds of plan, but in the new channels that migrants will invent within them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for that really fascinating insights into this, these issues that we've been talking about here all along this year, migration issues, but from such a unique angle and focus on a particular place and space. So really looking forward to hearing Lori Hart's comments on the book and then conversation with the group. I'll just, should I um, stop sharing? Yeah. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, um, Marjorie, David, Roger, everybody, for inviting me to comment on this amazing book. Um, and as Julie said, I'm especially happy to be here too because of having known her as an undergraduate. Um, she was a beautiful writer and thinker then and all the more so now. And immersing myself in her book has has really meant encountering a brilliant colleague and not at all a former student. <laughs> so it's, um, it's really a privilege to be here. Um, the first thing I wanna say is uh, that this book really roots the reader inside this station. The rest of Paris starts to feel very peripheral, in fact. Uh, when we get to Mali, as we follow um, you to your friend Lassan's home, we feel the string leading back to the Gare du Nord. Uh, you've made the case very powerfully that we should take this site seriously. 
It will certainly never pass through any station. Uh, I will cer certainly never pass through any station in the same way uh, because my eyes will be different um, and my head will be full of questions. So I, I think that is, you know, to my mind, the best of anthropology. Uh, the special language you highlight is magnetic when uh, your friend Lasana suggests to his friend Dulé that he respond to rejection from a passing girl with essentially, hey, this isn't your living room, it's an international station. Like, take it seriously, you French, you so -called in your so-called internationalism. Or when he distinguishes between the weak ties that uh, work inside the station for certain purposes and the stronger bonds of lasting friendship using the metaphor of eat in versus take out fast food. These are moments of, of really magical transformation and rhetorical power. And so one really gets a feeling that, um, that you're talking about of, of casting things in a different light. Um, I've been recently um, teaching a course in urban anthropology and going back to W.E.B. Du Bois's work on Philadelphia and your insight into migration as constitutive of the modern city uh, and not as peripheral or additive is resonates very much with, with his, um, his early insights. Your book reminds us that Paris was indeed organized around a defensive anticipation of the destabilization, containment, securitization of migrants and mobility itself. The imagined a real threat posed by the savage peasant, the transient worker, the lumpen proletariat, and eventually the African migrant. But your regard do not, as you just showed, um, and I really appreciated seeing those final pictures too, which are uh, new to me. Uh, your regard du Nord is very malleable in its spatial expressions of these core bourgeois aspirations. Uh, we have the 19th century compartmentalization of classes in their discrete waiting rooms and then their collectivization in a democratic great hall for social mixing. But that mixing is highly constrained by the rule that bodies have to move fast and fluidly past each other. And then there's the more recent neoliberal exchange hub that you showed promoting consumption and leisure for the professional urban classes, but on the backstage, securitization through both brute and virtual power. Migrants who might have been deta detained from straying from their assigned waiting rooms in the 19th century are now criminalized for staying in place where they are supposed to move. Your analysis of the Gare has broader implications for an understanding of border control regimes as well. And I'm thinking about how those Escher-like mazes of tracks and gates and escalators and levels and doors resonates with A.L. Weitzman's picture of uh, de facto apartheid in Israel-Palestine as a holographic maze funneling Jewish, Israelis, and Arabs, and Palestinians into distinct corridors and levels of landscape. And of course, this is just what they're refusing, um, your adventurers. This modern border as a shifting strategy of flexible walls and containment and diversion and strategic violence can be applied at the level of the public building or of the state. Within this invisible holographic system, the adventurers activate their radar, their own radar of attuned vigilance, as, as you call it. The claim that the charismatic Mali and Lasana makes that he's an adventurer is a transformed vision, version, as you say, of the West African rite of passage to confront risk and develop social becoming. This makes both cultural as well as material sense given the precariousness of uh, local West African economies at the moment. And you make that connection strongly and well. Um, you don't necessarily want to reside in those places from which you draw power. Um, I, um, I mean, the, in, in some West African cosmologies, the land of the dead is the paradig paradigmatic outside source of power. So clearly you don't wanna live there. Um, but most migration models have a more melancholic gloss uh, to them, and that's one of the things that's refreshing about this book. I'm thinking in particular of the Greek concept of nostos, in which an overwhelming longing for home seems to annihilate the possibility of an upbeat adventure narrative. So 
In the end, Lasana makes some minimally effective transcontinental exchanges and links. And I'd like to hear a little bit more about how effective you think those have been. Um, more time has passed even now since you finished the book. And I'm curious about that. Um, you do say that the tangible results are ambivalent at best um, and suggest that we think about adventure as forging, forging an ethic. And I, I think that is a really helpful uh, way to think about this casting of migration. It's not a mode of life so much as a mode of handling life. So let me just conclude with um, three questions or maybe four questions um, that are a little more specific. The first one is that um, among the most provocative sections in the book is the short part on nationalism and the perils of belonging. And I think this is really good to think with. You note the rise of what Geshira calls autochthony politics in West Africa. And one could note other parts of Africa as well. Uh, and Mahmoud Mandani's caveats from the case of Rwanda and Burundi uh, relating to um, native and stranger. The, pit the pitting of native against stranger in xenophobic policies, the expulsion of so-called migrants in times of economic austerity and the pressures of eco-catastrophe are not all recent phenomena. They have their colonial and pre-colonial genealogies. The Ghanaian theorist Ato Kwesen emphasizes this for Accra in his recent book, Oxford Street. He notes the tension between the so-called native Ga and stranger groups over claims to land. The marginalization of Northern migrants to certain sectors of the city suggests that hierarchical, what he calls multi-ethnicity is the dominant pattern while tolerant multiculturalism is confined to specific quasi-elite domains like the salsa dancing club that he describes. So in some sense, I am wondering whether or not the adventure ethic is in fact produced by this frame of fixed multi-ethnicity of natives and strangers that can kick you out when it needs to, and that this adventure ethic somehow accommodates that. It's one thing to say, as you do, in respecting the position of the adventurers, that they're not interested in mobilizing, but in moving, and that mobilization is nothing without mobility. But it would also seem that the adventure ideology, that they're not looking for citizenship, just a fluctuation between zones, is just what the world wants from a guest worker. Both states and guest workers get something from the difference that mobility confers, but it has to be said that it's possible the states get more from this difference. So I'm curious to hear more about the role that native claims play for the adventures. Lasana, as I understand it, at least has a locally quasi elite position in Mali is his attitude towards French citizenship and dependence connected to this native stranger dynamic? How might his positionality and status at home inflect this? How do we set uh, challenging the teleology of the sedentarist narrative alongside this set of ideas about natives and strangers in their interaction between West Africa and France? I see I'm going a little bit long here, so I'll be very brief in my two other questions. The second question is a more simple social structural one, which is I'm trying to place these adventures in their social and economic context within the economy of the Ga. So on the pragmatic level, they use the station to find wage labor work through contacts and sometimes invent new sorts of revenue on the spot, such as the Porter Drifts was able to do. But um, how do they navigate the illicit, illegal economy, the drugs, prostitution, contraband, et cetera? How do they protect themselves against other networks? Are they so insulated as they seem? Is this adventure ideology a way of creating a shield or a claim that does require recognition by others, by other migrants or by others who also claim space in the station? How are those, how are those um, groups interacting, if at all? Um, and then the third question is that in the US, we're more, uh, we're more often concerned with, the, this is a phenomenological question. So this is about, um, yeah, 
the way they the way they be in the station. In the US, we're more often concerned with the loitering, a term with a racist history of the homeless in public spaces. The adventurers are not homeless. Um, they have apartments, they have dormitories. And um, I am wondering um, if you have more to say about the interaction between those different spaces that they do occupy right, apart from the Gare. In any case, but in the in the guard itself, they're not homeless, but they are staying too long in one place, as you put it, in a regime that is demanding circulation. So I'm trying to grasp what that staying actually feels like. Acting, waiting, running in place. Um, while Javier Aullero and others have thought about the time register of poverty as a disposition of waiting, Quaison makes the distinction between what he calls free time, that is the mark of the life of the poor and especially marginalized migrants in Accra, as contrasted with the leisure time of the rich. So he calls free time the phenomenological dimension of the informal economy that pushes you to the, quote, recycling of cells, objects, and space. In other words, being forced to do something or die trying, as he puts it, which could be a way of describing the suspended and what you call anti-teleological -tele mode of the adventures. So I'm wondering if you could say something more about adventuring as a different phenomenology or a better model. Um, you caution against casting these lives as heroic, but there is a celebratory language in the way they describe themselves. And is that a kind of phenomenology, I guess I would ask. Um, so those are my questions. Um, I would love to hear more of your thoughts also on the last point that you made about the infrastructure and the changing infrastructure and how much, you know, that in that sort of, you only mentioned Deserto briefly in your book, which I was sort of grateful for. Sometimes he seems to overwhelm <laughs> these kinds of discussions. Um, <clears throat> but I'm just wondering about the interplay between infrastructure and sociability and so on. And if you have some other thoughts about that interplay between the form, the architecture of the gar and its possibilities, a kind of Lefebvre de Soto debate about the fixity stuff and the mobile people stuff. Thank you so much for the pleasure of reading this book. It is fantastic. It is succinct. It is a great book for classes. <laughs> I recommend that everyone assign it immediately. Um, yeah. Thank you for Thank those you. wonderful comments, Laurie, it, to just generate such a rich discussion on of a rich a book that deserves such rich discussion. Julie, you had some time to respond to the questions Laurie posed, and then we're getting some questions in the chat, and we'll, we'll move to a conversation soon. So would you like to respond first? Uh, sure, I can attempt to respond briefly. Um, I don't think that I can do justice to those questions right now because, um, as usual, um, Lori, you've brought up, you know, made you know incredible connections and sort of suggestive analyses and pathways that I could further explore um, and that I haven't thought about before. So um, I don't, um, I don't think I can, I can sort of re respond to all of that right now. But I've noted it. Um, and I will think more about it. Um, you know, uh, however, I think I could say um, this question of um, ethnicity, multi ethnicity, um, native versus stranger. Um, you know, I think that's been an increasingly present preoccupation of mine since I wrote the book, um, and especially in my new work which is more based in Bamako and on migrants and migrant rights groups um, who are from West and Central Africa and are trying to mobilize for migrant rights while also attempt to do kind of caretaking initiatives for deported migrants, but also all sorts of other displaced people. And these are exactly the issues that they're confronting. Um, and what I find with, in their case, is a clearer articulation of how the adventure ethic um, speaks to these differences. Now, first, I think we can talk about the question of ethnicity. Um, 
and especially in a context where the lens of ethnic conflict is increasingly being put onto Mali um, and other parts of you know, Cote d'Ivoire as well. So places where a lot of people I spoke to were from uh, by you know, international think tanks, European governments, um, NGOs who see what's going on as ethnic conflict um, you know, increasingly in Mali. And, um, and even as, you know, potential, having a potential for genocide was one of the recent reports I saw, um, you know, which to me is a very dangerous narrative um, to be imposing on a place where that was not the case. And I think it actually risks making it the case because um, groups who lack resources um, see the potential for making ethnic-based claims, they can get European, especially French attention um, by ma making claims based on ethnicity. So I think this is a very complex set of issues right now that are urgent to, to address. Now, in the context of my work here, what I find, especially having done this more recent work, um, is that this notion of being an adventurer and of um, the connections that adventures make across um, national boundaries across ethnic boundaries, they still use ethnic and national boundaries. Those are still important, as I express in the book. There's all sorts of ways that you know ethnic ethnic boundaries are are constituted in these interactions and are so critical to these interactions. Um, and you know, one of the key things I wanted to to illustrate um, was how um, you know these notions of who they were and who they were becoming as adventures were constituted in these boundaries and and in these interactions. Um, the adventure ethic in the case of migrant mobilization becomes a way of challenging, um, I think, nationalism, um, and this becomes more clear in the case of the. Um, the activists that I'm working with now in Bamako, who um, are going against the kind of xenophobic narratives that exist around the African continent now as well, um, and trying to make a claim for a broader, um, or not even, I wouldn't say broader, but for a different uh, mode of attachment and of belonging um, that is based on a shared history, not just of movement, and mobility, which is really important, going back to pre-colonial movement mobility, but also a shared history um, of being displaced and of, of, of moving, um, of not being allowed to move. So sort of the, his, a shared history of deportation becomes the grounds for belonging in a political project. Um, whether you're from Latin America or from West Africa, um, you know, or from Eastern Europe, this shared history of um, deportation and displacement can become the grounds for a movement. Um, and that is what is challenging uh, the rising sort of xenophobic um, uh, sort of ethnic nationalism that many people have pointed out are on the rise all over the place, um, including uh, around places where these migrants have migrated to, such as Angola, Congo, South Africa, of course, is often the main case, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, they all have versions of this um, sort of ethnic nationalism that have risen. And um, in the Mali and in, in Bamako, you know, there's really, I think um, they're trying to challenge that through this alternative form of belonging. And that alternative form of belonging, um, I think really interestingly, almost ends up creating a class-based identification because you're talking about essentially a global worker proletariat, people who want to move but can't um, based you know, on their, their attempts. These are people who would be mostly considered to be economic migrants. Like they're not, they sometimes include refugees but so much of the time it's about economic migrants and people who have been deported because they didn't have documentation because they didn't have papers. Um, and so in many ways, this is um, this particular class. And as you point out as well, um, this class, and I think this is supported by this notion of being an adventurer. Um, and, you know, this um, global working class, you know, of migrants is the kind of um, appeal that they're making. I don't think they, they don't state it quite that way. Um, but when I see them interacting with people from different places, that's sort of the the tenor that it takes on. And I, I'm still thinking about that, but that's sort of one of the main things I've seen. And I think that also speaks to your other point about um, sort of Lassana's position or in general, their positions within 
where they came from. Now he he refers to him as a noble in this sort of caste system that still exists. Um, in uh, and it's not like a caste system like in India. It's like a um, you know occupational caste. So uh, there's nothing sort of there's nothing that there's nothing endogamous about it in the anthropological sense. Um, but you, he's still you know from a very poor rural area of Mali. I mean you know with parents who were farmers um, who never went to school. He himself only went to um, Quranic school, so had access to very little uh, in the way of job potentials in Mali. Um, so, I mean, you know, he's absolutely still, as one of my Malian colleagues would say, on the periphery of the periphery of the periphery. Um, you know, but I think that um, seeing himself as part of this adventure lineage gives him a different sense of what, you know, his overall pathway in life must be. And this is true for many of them. And in this book, I look at how that, you know, articulate sort of ends up creating a social space for them and a, and a new urban space. And in my new research, I look at how it might create the basis for more of a political movement. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have two questions in the chat and anyone else can um, add to the uh, chat or the q and I should say, um, or use the raise hand function. Uh, the first question is from Marja. Karelia about what about migrant women and children? So, mm -hmm. uh, yes, thank you for this comment. Um, absolutely, I, um, I I do have to admit that I receive this comment almost every time that I present this work. Um, in part, perhaps in this version of the talk, um, I don't emphasize that this aspect, which is part of the work, perhaps more than is evident in this talk, and I'll have to think about why I do that. Um, but so, thank you. Um, however, I think, you know, of course, first of all, you know, we focus on different things in our research and the Gare du Nord is a masculine space. And I talk about in my book how it is a space to find my masculinity. So yes, it's true that um, women and children as migrants themselves are not a huge part of my um, overall focus. Um, they're extremely important to understanding, you know, what these people are doing at the Gal and how they do it. And, um, you know, I spend quite a lot of time with their families. So um, that is just to say that um, this space is defined, I think, um, as a masculine space. And many women I know experience it as such as well. Um, and so I think the lens of um, thinking about how it's, how it's a gendered space, um, you know, uh, and, and a particular kind of gendered space is a crucial aspect to understanding how the Gal works. And I experienced it myself and had to confront it in my own research. So that's sort of one side, which isn't quite getting at the question. Um, but the other thing is that, um, you know, perhaps the, the chapter that I didn't really talk about in the book, in the talk was, um, you know, is really about questions of how kin relationships and networks get re-articulated through, um, through this process. Um, and you can certainly see that in the case of, um, of, of most of these men, um, including their sibling relationships, which become really important, um, but also uh, questions of how to raise children um, who might be born to couples who meet at the Gal du Nord that are what the French call mixed couples. Um, and, you know, where those children will be raised, how they will be raised. Um, you know, relationships to in-laws, that all becomes uh, a major issue. And of course, the weight of, um, of kinship in these areas, because many of these men, I, you know, have sisters or, um, I mean, many of them have sisters who are currently living in France who, you know, became sort of part of their, um, part of their story. And again, they're not my explicit focus because of the way that I defined and delimited my object of research. Um, and there's a lot of really excellent work, I think, a growing amount of really good work looking specifically um, at women and maybe a little less at men. Um, what's really fascinating is that the work on women um, tends to focus much more on children and the work on men um, does not focus on children, sort of reproducing so many of the uh, <laughs> stereotypes that we have in, in our own research, which I think is something to rethink. Um, but yeah, I'm certainly more aware of this question, I think, in my current research um, in how 
these spaces get defined as masculine spaces and what it means to really focus um, almost entirely on men because that's the um, you know the presence of what it means to be an adventurer is absolutely a gendered uh, definition of coming of age and women were often ex absolutely excluded but that doesn't mean that women aren't important to the story or you know I mean they're absolutely constitutive of this story and of who these men are so um, I try to express that in my work as well um, but again it's not the focus. So uh, before we move to we have a number of wonderful questions um, but just to plant to add on to this um, and maybe come back to it later uh, it just makes me wonder about um, the gendered nature of this uh, uh, cross, uh, this solidarity of working classness or whatever we're, you're calling it. Uh, in, in what ways is that gendered? In what ways are there more opportunities for the solidarity to, to be built um, than women may have? I don't know. But also constructions of, of constructions of childhood and I, I you mentioned Lissandra was 14 when he began planning and I missed how uh, to leave how old was he when he actually came and I'm thinking about the discourses here of unaccompanied minors and what we mean by minors and so maybe we can come back to that conversation because we have I think three or four wonderful uh, there's another one coming in more questions so let's move on to Suzanne's question Suzanne would you like to come live and and pose it yourself um, uh, I think we can allow you to do that. <laughs> I'm not sure the technology, or I can read it. Suzanne says, thanks for a lively, informative talk. Oh, here she, no, yep, here she comes. You can speak for yourself, Suzanne. <laughs> well, I, I sent it to you, so now I can't read it. Why don't you read it, please? Okay. Thanks for a lively, informative talk. Do you know anything about the experiences of the Antillas? migrants from the French West Indies. You stress that French whites feel black Africans are not assimilating. What about the Antillas who are- Antillas, Antille, not, not the Antillas. That might be, might, might be Spanish. It's the Antillas. Okay, Antillas, <laughs> yeah, my French. Uh, do French whites even notice the difference among black ethnic, quote unquote, ethnicities? Well, this is a, a great and very complex question. Um, <laughs> And you know there are some, uh, you know there there are a lot of scholars who have examined specifically um, the question of blackness in France and how it um, sort of gets divided along these lines of African and Antillais. Um, and so I'm not going to speak to all of those issues, but I will speak to how it appeared in my own research, uh, which is that um, these borders became very important to impart to these West Africans who um, I, I spoke with and they found that the borders between um, you know, themselves and, and Antillais, uh, but also other, uh, other forms of what they saw, um, of what they, you know, they said that you know, the French police, and they often referred to the French police as thinking this, the French police as thinking that. And many times that was sort of a shorthand, I think, for like the French in general, but you know, the sort of the state right, because the police are the ones they interact with frequently. Um, and so, you know, they would say things like, you know, the French police sort of see us as all the same. Um, they don't see the different iterations of blackness. Um, and whereas we're, this is, these are totally different. And so the difference between um, sort of Africans and people of African origin and Antille is one of the main dividing lines that they saw. Um, and there's even sort of a moment where you know, one guy at the Gare du Nord tells, not to me, but to a French journalist, um, that, you know, that he, he said the Gare du Nord is for entier, E-N-T-I-E-R-S, holes, a, a, which means, you know, like the whole thing, um, versus, and not entier, which are <laughs> kind of homonyms, um, entier versus entier, um, words that sound very similar to each other. So meaning that, um, you know, Antillais Ant were not wholes, whole Africans, but, you know, again, um, based on their history, not quite um, as whole as Antillais. And so, and, and, and whereas there's a different station, which is Leal, um, the Châtelet Leal, which is for the Antillais. Um, so there's also this question of, of different kinds of urban territory as it maps onto forms of blackness uh, in France. Um, and 
you know, they also were very critical of um, the, the Caribbean, uh, French Caribbean um, police officers who they thought were particularly hard on them um, and particularly racist towards them as Africans. Um, and, you know, again, this is their sort of articulation of it, um, of, how, of how these differences work. So I think this is a this is a complex issue, but I just want to point out that it it's a very important sort of social question that gets replayed in their interactions um, with the with the police, sometimes with each other. And then the other main difference was this difference, this boundary between what they called les blédards et les renois. Les blédards being country, like which is basically a word for a country bumpkin, right? I mean, it's a it's almost like a I think a bit of a pejorative term. Um, and the Renoir, which is the sort of the slang and version slang for, for black, um, who they saw as people who were born in France. So they might be of African origin, but they were born in France uh, versus them who came from the bled, who came from, and of course this is a wonderful like Arabic <laughs> French uh, hybrid word that they're, that's being used and then sort of reformed to de define themselves. So this becomes a really important distinction for them. And again, they criticize the police for not being able to see these distinctions. Um, so I think those are, I can't speak to all of the ways that this comes up in general in France, um, but this is the ways that these issues that are that are the core of your question, I think, came up in my own research. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm trying to keep the order, uh, but I'm not sure I've got it right. I think Hiroshi's had his hand up, so we'll invite Hiroshi in. Um, and then I think we'll follow with Kataraya and Jonathan, no, and Judy Hellman had a question in the chat. So they're coming in in different forms, different, um, yeah. Hiroshi. Am I here? And then Jonathan. Okay. Yep, you're here. We hear you. Um, okay, I'm not sure I turn my camera on, but maybe that's... Hi. Sorry. Okay. I'm here now. Hang on a second. I've got the wrong cam um, camera going here. But I just, you know, uh, this this gets into some things that I don't think you talked to uh, talked about in the in in your talk. But maybe I'll be in the book, and so it may just be a question of direct me to where in the book. Um, but a couple of things that um, you I fall in the category of sort of government interventions. Um, and uh, you, you were speaking to some extent about what was going on inside uh, France. But um, a couple of things that um, at, the, at the EU level have been very interesting in this regard. One is the emergency trust fund for Africa and the other um, is the EU strategy on voluntary return and reintegration. Um, and what I'm inter actually interested in is, is not so much sort of how those op operate in, in, a, in a precise terms as much as what the consciousness is um, of those initiatives and to what extent there's sort of a um, awareness or an influence that those kinds of government or EU um, EU initiatives are, are having on, on, on anything on the ground. So if I understand your question, the, what kind of um, effect these, these sort of EU strategies, which um, try to get convinced migrants to leave the Europe and return. Um, I mean, in other words, uh, in theory, I mean, you could you, you one possible answer you could give me is that is that it is tremendously influential in all kinds of decisions, uh, and the other is that it has no effect at all on anyone's consciousness. And I just didn't know where 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 we were you know, on that spectrum. Yeah, I would say the latter. It has almost no effect. Um, in my new research, I, I see how this works quite significantly more. Um, what's interesting is I think perhaps what has had more of an effect, not necessarily on migration, but on other things is the idea of co-development, which has long been like this idea that you develop places in Africa in order to convince people to stay at home, which is totally a failure. I mean, that doesn't work. Um, I don't, I don't know if I really want to I don't necessarily want to like publish that because you know if these places are getting some money, the projects might fail some of the time, but they're getting some money. Um, you know the 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 French have a program for this, um, 
you know, most of the people I spoke to sort of made fun of the the French project. Um, I I don't really know as much about the EU program, but there is a, a the French Office of Immigration um, has this program to where they give Im, you know, Im, um, West Africans money to return, and then they give them help in setting up like a, an agricultural business, for example, or some sort of business once they're home. These are extremely small scale. I know the the heads of these offices in France, they're much more a discourse than actual projects. So, um, you know, you see these posters for, hey, we'll give you some money if you return. I talked to the head of this office in Mali. He said they only have a few migrants every year who do it. So, um, you know, I would say relatively little effect. Okay, um, Katharina, uh, Katharina us, can you speak to the differences between migrants who are Muslim and those who are not in, in, in the Gare, excuse me, my French, you know, I, I, it reminds me when I was, never mind, um, reading things rather than saying them in terms of, how, of the way they are received, their networks and access, etc. So the question of Muslimness. Yeah, it's a really important question. Um, almost all of the adventurers I know there um, are Muslim. Um, and uh, commitment to Islam absolutely structured their idea of what the adventure is. Um, in many ways, it's similar to this idea of the Rihla and um, of a long tradition of sort of Islamic journeys. Um, and so I, I, you know, I think this, this is a very important question in terms of, um, yeah, how it, how it structured their, their acceptance. You know, um, I think you would maybe have to look at more of a sociological study to draw a broader conclusion that would fully answer your question. In this case, um, I would say that in terms of how they're received by the state, their access, et cetera, um, how they're policed, um, was much more based on race than on religion uh, from their own experience anyway. Um, they, uh, you know, I, I think in many ways, um, you know, the Muslim, um, the figure of the Muslim has been this figure of potential danger in France. But I also argue that, um, especially starting in the 1990s uh, into the 2000s and like sort of this moment of this so-called riot being a key moment where particularly it was represented as um, black people and particularly black men as being as representing a danger to France and sort of occupying this um, potential danger. Um, while at the same time, you have the parallel uh, figure of, um, you know, uh, a North African Muslim as occupying a danger um, to France and, and to the French state as well. Um, so you, you have both of these, but for these men, I would say in terms of their um, existence in the labor market, their um, experiences with police and um, with, you know, trying to get papers, it was much more about, um, you know, their race and their origin than about their religion for them. Um, okay, Judy, would you like to come on and ask your question, Judy Hellman, or I'll read it, but feel free to come on so we can see you. Um, thanks for the presentation of what sounds like a truly wonderful read. Much of what you describe reminds me of the colonization, quote unquote, colonization by so-called ex-communitaria of Rome's Stazione Termini. Boy, I'm getting my work out on my languages. Uh, in the mid 1990s, when I was working on a project framed as, quote, when an Im immigrant sending becomes an immigrant receiving society, unquote but with one notable difference, which was that the Termini became the hub of a very mixed immigrant neighborhood of at least 12 square blocks immediately adjacent to the nation as distinct from the Parisian Banu as the dormitory of the immigrants who congregated. So actually I see this as a comment, not a question, but would you like to respond to it at all, Julie? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of parallels and I've been fascinated by Termini as well, um, having been there several times. Um, but just to clarify, I mean, the Gau du Nord is a very, very mixed space. So it's, it's unlike, maybe this wasn't clear enough in my talk, but it's, it's totally different from the dormitory and the banya. It's, it's a very mixed space. 
um, the neighborhood itself is actually predominantly, um, the area right around the Cap de Nord is predominantly South Asian now, um, but has hosted waves of migrants um, and immigrants throughout um, the entire 20th century. So, and, and they're, they're sort of the layering of these migrant trajectories within the neighborhood um, that becomes a, a really important part. So um, I think it's seen in part as a kind of colonization or the, you know, it's, or it's seen as, you know, what someone, this right-wing politician said, you know, uh, la Gare du Nord, c'est l'Afrique, you know, it's Africa now, they've taken over. Um, and, you know, I was like, well, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying something different, which is, you know, the whole point is that it's international, right? Um, it's actually a space of coming together of different trajectories. And so it's not um, the idea of, of one taking over. And if it did become that, then uh, for example, um, these adventurers would no longer be interested in it because those are exactly the spaces that they don't see as full of potential for realizing the very difficult um, process of, of becoming a successful adventurer in France. So um, I think Jonathan's question might add on to that um and we're having some more questions coming in so as we, as just keep in mind you can put them in the different forms and i'm trying to keep track of them while i'm at it i just want to do a little um commentary to remind people to fill out our survey because one of the things we ask about the survey from this year's events is how did you experience the online presence and the working and the, even even having our absent audience so you know just be sure to fill that out so we can be thinking about how we'll do this next year in the hope that some of it will be live. But back to the questions. Um, Jonathan, if you'd like to come on, we can see you, but I'll go ahead and read. Is the Gare du Nord a place with a significant pr police presence? Are more aggressive policing tactics used? Or are they just there for a presence and to stand by? What are the police trying to get people for trespassing? and or other charges related to their immigration or citizenship status. Yeah, absolutely. There's a huge police and security presence. There are something like nine different police and security forces um, present in the station from the railway police to the um, sort of anti-terrorism uh, military forces um, that patrol it to the national police, the judicial, there are two, um, actually there's two police stations, or I think now there's only one when they redesigned it, but basically two police stations within the station itself. Um, and one is a special unit of the, what they call the investigative police. Um, and so there's also the customs. So, I mean, security is sort of an ever present reality in the station. Um, and so are these so-called, you know, what they call identity checks um, where they just ask you for your papers. Um, and so it's very clear and it's actually been shown in this study by the Open Justice Site Initiative around the time I was doing my research. Um, you, know, you understood that, um, that the, um, that, you know, if you're a black, especially if you're a young black man, you're about eight or nine times more likely to be stopped by the police than if you're white, um, you know, and they, and they sort of did this, um, they just sort of tracked this um, secretively in the station for, for several months. Um, and they chose the Gare du Nord because of course it's known as a place where people are stopped. Um, and so interactions with the police really become a daily, um, uh, occurrence for many of these men and a daily part of what it means to do the Gal du Nord method. So it's one of the chapters that I decided not to, to focus on um, explicitly in this talk, but um, absolutely the police almost become part of their Gal du Nord method. So obviously as a repressive force, um, potentially they could have danger. If they're undocumented, they could be deported if they were to talk to the police. I mean, if they were to get stopped by the police, so they avoid that um, using all sorts of tactics. And, um, you know, the, the, the police also become almost part of their attempt to, to illustrate their own mastery over the space um, and sort of show the police that they, they know the space better than them um, and they can um, sort of outmaneuver them in many ways. And I think in, in some cases it becomes a sort of show of masculine prowess as well um, in terms of their interactions with police. So I'm not trying to say that they're on equal footing here. But I also don't think that it's just about this kind of repressive force. It's very much, um, you know, uh, becomes part of the social world and their, and their Gal du Nord method. They have to confront the police. They have to deal with the police. Um, and, and the way that they do is, you know, um, I think quite telling in terms of how they're trying to, to get by in the station. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. Um, we have Lori, you could add your question yourself. Thanks. <clears throat> one of the um, one of the um, many interesting aspects of the book that um, that you haven't quite touched on is the view of the life course, so the, the long term ethnography aspect of it. And I was wondering. I think it would be interesting for people to hear a little bit more about the the aging of the group. They're not old, but you know the aging of the group and the transitions and how that view from the life course might inflect the model of the adventurer. I mean, if we situate it in biographical time as a model, you know, is it a model that just applies for ages 20 to 25? Is it a model that, you know, what, how do we situate that both in terms of your vision of it as a perhaps a recuperative narrative of some kind, um, but also just in terms of their own experiences and their own reflections back on their, uh, their you know, the disappointment of some of their um, ambitions and aspirations and also some of the satisfaction of parts of it. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, I think that um, that's a, a sort of central way of how you have to confront the life course if you're talking about adventure because they see it as part of their life course and they see it as a stage and they constantly talk about you know, what came before and what will come after. And, um, you know, that's sort of part of their mobile orientation to the space and to what they hope for their own lives um, and for their, you know, social becoming. Um, and so, you know, one thing to say is, I think it's supposed to be something that only lasts for a couple of years, but here is where the life course intersects with the political economic reality, which is that increasing restrictions on migration have made it so that this almost liminal period, this coming of age period um, that they imagined would only last for a few years um, before they would be able to, you know, at least return provisionally and um, begin building something um, in the places where their family is or in the capital cities, um, you know, where they might want to build a house as a marker of success, they're not able to do those things because they can't get papers, they can't get good jobs. Um, you know, they're in these temporary work jobs that aren't the kinds of jobs that maybe their uncles were able to access um, prior to the invention of clandestine migrant and the sort of creation of migration restrictions. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, this is where I think these two things come together is, is because it's this imagined as this life course stage, what happens when it starts to take over the life course? What happens when the adventure becomes, um, you know, something that goes over decades and they're not able to um, achieve the mobility that they want. Even when sometimes they do get papers, they still, um, the papers are very restrictive. They might have to renew them every year. It might be risky to go back. They might not ever be able to come back to France. Um, and then in, in Lassana's case, you know, he did get this coveted 10 year resident permit, giving him much more flexibility in his movement um, at the same time that the economy crashed and, you know, the kinds of jobs he was able to access were significantly reduced, um, meaning that he did not have the same kind of economic or sort of livelihood quasi security that he had, you know, prior. And, um, and so quickly he, he realized that he had to spend even longer and longer. So even as he went back to Mali for a couple months, you know, to sort of put in his time there, he knew that he would have to return, keep working, and then sort of putting off um, marrying, um, having children, um, marrying someone who his family would see as appropriate, all of these other markers of becoming a man, he ends up avoiding. Um, and this was the case of many of the men. Um, that I met at the Gadnor, many of these adventurers who are confronting these increasing restrictions and economic marginalization um, and having to deal with what happens when it, when it extends over such a period of time. And this is why it changes, I think, when they do go back, even some of the men I met in, um, you know, in, in Mali, in these mostly pretty rural areas of the Sahel, who had, many of them had been on on Aventure before, and they almost couldn't quite resettle in their villages because it had gone on for so long, because it wasn't what they imagined, because of the kinds of restrictions, sometimes violence, um, sometimes very risky situations that they um, had, that they kind of continued trying to build ties outside of their villages, almost in this adventure logic that they had 
that sort of had just become them on the road. Um, I believe we have one more question. Michelle, are you there? Could you come on and answer, uh, ask your question? I know we're getting close to our 1.30 end time. So while we wait for Michelle, um, let me just say two things. Um, please fill out the survey. It, Sophia has given you the link to it. So we have a better sense of how you experience this year's events and what we should do next year. We have two more talks, one next week on the wealth of refugees, how, um, displaced pe how displaced people can build economies. And then we have our final session will be a celebration of UCLA authors. Um, I wish we could have our audience visible to us, but the way we opted to do this format this year, we have an invisible audience, but many people out there in the audience. We also want to remind people we have uh, the podcast of this talk will be available on our Center for the Study of International Migration website, so people can hear the talks you've missed and maybe tell other people to listen and go out and buy this book too. Um, thank you so much, Julie, for leading us in this rich conversation. Thank you, Lori, for your comments. Thanks to everyone for coming out, and we hope to see people back next week.